My name is Joe and I own a small ranch out in the rugged terrains of West Texas. It's a quiet life, filled with the predictable routines of tending to cattle, fixing fences, and enjoying the vast, open skies that stretch endlessly above. Most days are the same, with little to distinguish one from another, but there was one night that I'll never forget, the night I spotted the chupacabra. It was late August, and the air was still, thick with the lingering heat of the day. The sun had dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and purple. But the oppressive warmth clung to the earth like a stubborn ghost. I was out on the porch, nursing a cold beer and savoring the rare moment of peace. The cicadas were singing their nightly chorus, and the occasional lowing of cattle in the distance was the only other sound. I was just about to head inside when I heard something strange, a series of high-pitched yelps followed by a low guttural growl. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard before, and it sent a chill down my spine despite the heat. I set my beer down and grabbed my flashlight and rifle, more out of habit than actual fear. Wild animals weren't uncommon out here, and I figured it was probably just a coyote or a stray dog. As I walked towards the noise, the sounds grew louder, more frantic. I shone my flashlight around the beam cutting through the darkness, but I couldn't see anything at first. The ground was uneven, and I stumbled a few times on loose rocks and dry patches of grass. Just as I was about to give up and head back to the house, I saw it, a dark shape moving quickly through the shadows near the edge of the pasture. My heart began to pound as I focused the light on the figure. It was too big to be a coyote, and its movements were too erratic. It darted back and forth, almost as if it were hunting something. Then it turned, and the beam of my flashlight caught its eyes, glowing red like hot coals in the night. I froze, my breath catching in my throat. The creature was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It stood on two legs, hunched over, with long, spindly arms that ended in clawed hands. Its skin was a sickly, mottled gray, covered in patches of coarse hair. The face was the most terrifying part, a twisted, snarling visage with sharp, protruding fangs and those eerie, glowing eyes. For a moment, we just stared at each other, neither of us moving. Then, with a sudden burst of speed, it lunged towards me. I barely had time to react, raising my rifle and firing a shot. The bullet whizzed past it, and the creature let out an ear-piercing screech before veering off to the side, disappearing into the night. I stood there, shaking, trying to process what I'd just seen. My rational mind wanted to dismiss it as a trick of the light, a hallucination brought on by fatigue and too many ghost stories. But deep down, I knew what it was, the legendary Chupacabra, the goat sucker of local lore. I'd heard the stories, of course, tales of livestock found drained of blood, but I'd never given them much credence, until now. Over the next few days, I couldn't shake the memory of that night. I found myself glancing over my shoulder, jumping at every unexpected noise. I told a few of my neighbors, but most of them just laughed it off, saying I was letting my imagination run wild. Only old man took me seriously. He'd lived in these parts his whole life and claimed to have seen the chupacabra once, years ago. You ain't crazy, Joe, he said, his weathered face serious. That thing's real. Seen it with my own eyes. Best be careful. It's dangerous. Despite the warnings, life on the ranch had to go on. I couldn't afford to let fear get in the way of my work. But I started taking precautions, keeping the cattle closer to the house at night, setting up motion sensor lights around the property, and carrying my rifle with me everywhere I went. A week later, I found the first victim. One of my goats, lying lifeless in the field, its body eerily untouched except for two small puncture wounds on its neck. There was no blood, no signs of a struggle. It was as if the life had been sucked right out of it. My heart sank, and a cold dread settled over me. The chupacabra was real, and it was hunting on my land. 
Determined to protect my ranch, I set up a makeshift watchtower on the edge of the property, a high vantage point where I could keep an eye on things. Every night I took up my post, scanning the darkness for any signs of movement. It was exhausting, and the sleepless nights began to take their toll. But I couldn't rest knowing that creature was out there. One night, just as the moon was rising, I saw it again. The chupacabra was skulking around the far side of the pasture, moving with that same eerie, predatory grace. I raised my rifle, steadying my aim, and fired. The shot rang out, echoing through the night, and the creature let out a howl of pain. It staggered but didn't fall, turning to face me with those burning red eyes. It charged, and I fired again, hitting it in the shoulder. This time, it stumbled, but kept coming. Panic surged through me, but I held my ground, firing shot after shot. Finally, with a final anguished scream, the chupacabra collapsed, lying motionless on the ground. I approached cautiously, my heart pounding in my ears. The creature was dead, its body twisted and still. Up close it looked even more monstrous, a horrifying blend of beast and nightmare. I felt a strange mix of relief and sorrow as I stared at it. This thing had terrorized me, threatened my livelihood, but it was also a living creature, something unknown and On the rugged coastline of New Zealand, where the wild, untamed waves of the Pacific Ocean crash against jagged cliffs, there is a small, picturesque village named Tairua. Nestled in a crescent-shaped bay, this village attracts tourists from all over the world with its stunning landscapes, lush greenery, and pristine beaches. But unbeknownst to many, Tairua harbors a mysterious secret whispered among the locals. The legend of the Marakai, a cryptid said to dwell in the depths of the ocean. It was a bright summer day when a group of tourists gathered at the local harbor, excited for their scheduled boat tour. The tour guide, a burly man with sun-kissed skin and a weathered face, introduced himself as Captain Teva. He was a man of few words, but possessed an air of quiet authority. The tourists, a mix of families, adventurous backpackers, and elderly couples, boarded the vessel their hearts brimming with anticipation. The boat, named the Seafarer, set off, cutting through the turquoise waters. As they sailed further from the shore, Captain Teva began sharing stories about the area's rich marine life and ancient Maori legends. He spoke of the Marakai, describing it as a creature of immense size, with the upper body of a man and the lower body of a fish. According to legend, the Marakai was a guardian of the ocean, a protector of the sea's creatures, and a harbinger of both fortune and misfortune. The tourists listened with rapt attention, some chuckling at the tale's absurdity, while others, particularly the children, gazed wide-eyed at the vast expanse of the ocean, hoping for a glimpse of the mythical creature. As the boat neared a remote cove known for its vibrant coral reefs, Captain Teva cut the engine, allowing the vessel to drift. He invited the tourists to take out their snorkeling gear and explore the underwater paradise. The water was crystal clear, revealing a world of colorful fish, intricate coral formations, and the occasional sea turtle gliding gracefully by. Among the snorkelers was a young couple, Emily and Jack, who had come to Tyrua for their honeymoon. Emily was an avid photographer, and she had brought along her underwater camera to capture the beauty of the reef. Jack, on the other hand, was a marine biologist, fascinated by the ocean's mysteries. As they swam further from the group, Emily suddenly tugged on Jack's arm, pointing excitedly towards the depths below. There, emerging from a cavernous crevice in the reef, was a shadowy figure. At first, it appeared to be a massive fish, but as it drew closer, its human-like features became evident. The creature had a broad, muscular chest, covered in scales that shimmered in shades of green and blue. Its eyes, large and almond-shaped, glowed with an eerie luminescence. Long flowing hair, reminiscent of seaweed, framed its face, and its lower body tapered into a powerful, finned tail. Emily's heart raced as she snapped photo after photo, while Jack stared in awe, unable to believe his eyes. 
the Marakai regarded them with a curious, almost knowing gaze, then swiftly swam away, disappearing into the ocean's depths as quickly as it had appeared. Breathless and exhilarated, Emily and Jack surfaced, shouting to the others about their incredible sighting. Captain Tiva's eyes widened with a mixture of astonishment and pride. He had heard tales of the Marakai from his ancestors, but had never seen it himself. The other tourists clamored around Emily and Jack, eager to see the photos. Back on the boat, as the tourists eagerly reviewed the images, the atmosphere buzzed with excitement and wonder. The photos were blurry, but there was no mistaking the creature's form. Captain Teva, now more animated than ever, recounted other stories of Marakai sightings, weaving a tapestry of folklore that enthralled his audience. As the sun began to set, casting a golden glow over the water, the seafarer returned to the harbor. Word of the Marakai sighting spread quickly through Tairua, drawing attention from journalists, researchers, and cryptid enthusiasts. Emily and Jack found themselves at the center of a media frenzy, their photos splashed across newspapers and online platforms. Intrigued by the possibility of discovering more about the Marakai, a team of marine biologists and cryptozoologists arrived in Tairua, eager to investigate. They interviewed the locals, delved into Maori legends, and set up underwater cameras in the area where Emily and Jack had seen the creature. Despite their efforts, the Marakai remained elusive. The underwater cameras captured glimpses of shadowy figures and fleeting movements, but nothing concrete. The scientific community was divided, with some dismissing the sighting as a hoax or a case of mistaken identity, while others remained open to the possibility of an undiscovered species. Meanwhile, Emily and Jack continued their honeymoon, finding solace in the beauty of Tyrua's landscapes and the warmth of its people. The encounter with the Marakai had deepened their bond, igniting a shared passion for the ocean's mysteries. They spent their days exploring hidden coves, diving into underwater caves, and immersing themselves in the local culture. One evening, as they walked along the beach hand in hand, they encountered an elderly Maori woman named Moana. She greeted them with a serene smile and introduced herself as a guardian of Tairua's ancient traditions. Moana had heard about their sighting and offered to share her knowledge of the Marakai. Under the silver light of the moon, Moana led them to a secluded spot near the water's edge. She began to chant softly in Maori, her voice carrying the weight of centuries-old wisdom. She explained that the Marakai was not merely a creature of legend, but a spirit of the ocean, embodying the balance between humanity and nature. According to her ancestors, the Marakai appeared to those who respected the sea and sought to protect its fragile ecosystems. Emily and Jack listened with reverence, understanding the profound significance of their encounter. They realized that their sighting of the Marakai was not just a fleeting moment of wonder, but a call to action. Inspired by Moana's words, they pledged to dedicate their lives to marine conservation, raising awareness about the importance of preserving the ocean's biodiversity. I had always been drawn to the wild, the untouched parts of the world where nature reigned supreme and stories of the unknown whispered through the grasses. As a wildlife researcher and cryptozoologist, I had spent years chasing legends and documenting creatures that science had yet to recognize. My latest expedition brought me to this beautiful and untamed land in search of one of the most elusive cryptids known to man, the Nandi Bear. The Nandi Bear, or Kimosit as the locals called it, had long been a subject of folklore and fear. Described as a ferocious, bear-like creature with a hyena's snout and formidable strength, it was said to roam the highlands and forests of western Kenya, particularly around the Nandi region. Sightings were rare and often dismissed as myth, but the stories persisted, and I was determined to uncover the truth. Armed with a notebook, a camera, and a healthy dose of skepticism, I set out into the field. My guide, a seasoned Maasai tracker named Kamau, led the way. He was a man of few words, but his knowledge of the land was unparalleled. As we trekked through the dense underbrush and crossed bubbling streams, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe at the sheer beauty of the landscape. 
The air was thick with the scent of wildflowers and damp earth, and the sounds of distant animal calls echoed around us. For days we followed leads and explored potential hotspots where the Nandi bear had been reportedly sighted. We interviewed local villagers who shared stories passed down through generations. Each tale added a new layer to the legend, the creature's piercing roar, its nocturnal habits, and the way it could vanish into the night as if it were a spirit. Despite the intrigue, there was no concrete evidence, and doubt began to creep in. One evening, as we set up camp near a small, secluded waterhole, Kamau pointed out a series of unusual tracks in the mud. They were unlike any animal prints I had ever seen. Large, with long, clawed toes that seemed to belong to no known species. My heart raced with excitement and trepidation. Could this be the proof I had been searching for? We decided to stake out the area, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature. As darkness fell, the sounds of the night enveloped us. The distant hoot of an owl, the rustling of leaves, and the occasional splash of water created a symphony of nature. Time seemed to stretch on, and my senses were heightened to every little movement. Suddenly, a low growl reverberated through the air. It was unlike any animal sound I had ever heard, deep, guttural, and filled with a primal intensity. I glanced at Kamau, whose eyes were fixed on the darkness beyond our campfire's glow. The growl came again, closer this time, and I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. Then, out of the shadows, it emerged. The Nandi Bear. It was larger than I had imagined, standing on all fours with a hulking, muscular frame covered in coarse, dark fur. Its head was indeed reminiscent of a hyena's, but with a more pronounced, almost bear-like muzzle. Its eyes glowed with an eerie luminescence, reflecting the flickering firelight. I was frozen in place, my mind racing with a mix of fear and fascination. The creature sniffed the air, its massive nostrils flaring, and then let out a bone-chilling roar that echoed across the plains. It was a sound that seemed to resonate with the very core of my being, a primal call that spoke of ancient instincts and untamed wilderness. Kamau remained still his eyes locked on the beast. The Nandi bear turned its head towards us, its eyes narrowing as if assessing the threat. My hands trembled as I lifted the camera, capturing the moment that would become the pinnacle of my career. For what felt like an eternity, the creature stood there, a living legend come to life. Then, with a final snort, it turned and lumbered back into the darkness, disappearing as swiftly as it had appeared. The night fell silent once more, the only sound the crackling of our campfire. I exhaled a breath I hadn't realized I was holding, my heart pounding in my chest. Kamau and I exchanged a glance, a shared understanding of the significance of what we had just witnessed. The Nandi bear was real, not just a figment of folklore, but a living, breathing creature of the African wilderness. When I first arrived in Zanzibar, the island's warm breezes and vibrant markets overwhelmed my senses. I had come to research marine ecosystems, but the whispers about a legendary creature, the Zanzibar leopard, had piqued my curiosity. Stories about these elusive cats had dwindled to almost mythic proportions, and I was determined to see if there was any truth to them. My name is David, a marine biologist by trade, but a wildlife enthusiast at heart. After a week of collecting water samples and studying coral reefs, I found myself entranced by the tales of the leopard. Most locals laughed off my interest, calling the leopard a ghost, a figment of the past. Yet, a few older residents spoke of sightings in hushed tones, as if fearing the mention of the leopard might summon it. One evening I met an old fisherman named Juma at a seaside bar. Over a glass of konyagi, he told me of a leopard sighting from his youth. His eyes gleamed with the memory as he described a sleek spotted cat slipping through the shadows of the Hosani forest. People say they are gone, but I know what I saw, Juma insisted, his voice a gravelly whisper. If you want to find the leopard, you must go deep into the forest where the mangroves meet the hills. That night, I couldn't sleep. Juma's words echoed in my mind, fueling a growing obsession. The next morning, I decided to follow his advice. Armed with my camera, binoculars, and a notebook, I set out for Josani Forest. 
The forest was a tangle of ancient trees, their roots snaking through the undergrowth, creating natural labyrinths. The air was thick with humidity and the chorus of cicadas. As I ventured deeper, the forest seemed to close in around me, its dense canopy filtering the sunlight into a greenish haze. For days I trekked through the forest, documenting the flora and fauna, but finding no trace of the leopard. I began to doubt Juma's tale, wondering if the leopard was indeed just a legend. On the fifth day, I reached the area where the mangroves met the hills, a remote, almost untouched part of the forest. It was late afternoon when I noticed something unusual. The ground beneath my feet had changed from the soft loam of the forest to a drier, rockier terrain. I crouched down and saw faint tracks, prints too large for a domestic cat but too precise to be from a canine. My heart pounded as I followed the trail. The tracks led to a small clearing surrounded by thick vegetation. I sat down behind a large rock, my camera poised, and waited. Hours passed, and the forest grew darker and quieter. The anticipation was electric, each rustle and crackle making my pulse quicken. Just as I was beginning to lose hope, I saw a movement at the edge of the clearing. My breath caught in my throat. There, emerging from the shadows, was the Zanzibar leopard. It moved with a fluid grace, its spotted coat blending perfectly with the dappled forest light. I watched in awe as the leopard approached a small waterhole, its muscles rippling under its skin. It was more beautiful than I had imagined, its coat a mosaic of rosettes and spots. I raised my camera, trying to steady my trembling hands, and snapped several photos. The leopard seemed unaware of my presence focused on quenching its thirst. I took the opportunity to observe it closely. It was lean but powerful, with piercing amber eyes that scanned the surroundings with a predatory vigilance. After a few minutes, it lifted its head, sniffed the air, and then with a final look around, slipped back into the forest shadows. I sat there for a long time replaying the encounter in my mind. I had seen it. The Zanzibar leopard was real. The thrill of the sighting was indescribable, a blend of triumph and reverence for this magnificent, elusive creature. The next day, I returned to the village, eager to share my discovery. Juma was the first person I sought out. When I showed him the photos, his eyes lit up with a mixture of joy and validation. I knew it, he said, clapping me on the back. You have seen what many believed was lost. Word of my sighting spread quickly and soon conservationists and researchers from around the world were contacting me for details. The photos sparked a renewed interest in the Zanzibar leopard, leading to discussions about habitat preservation and conservation efforts. In the months that followed, I continued my marine research but also dedicated time to studying the forest and its elusive inhabitants. The encounter with the Zanzibar leopard had changed me, deepening my appreciation for the delicate balance of nature and the importance of preserving it. The rain drummed softly on the roof of the antique shop as I stepped inside, seeking refuge from the storm. The air inside was thick with the scent of aged wood and dust, mingled with the faint aroma of polished brass and old books. Shelves lined with curiosities, relics of bygone eras, beckoned me to explore. As I wandered through the labyrinth of artifacts, my eyes were drawn to an ornate mirror propped against the far wall. Its frame, a rich mahogany intricately carved with floral patterns, seemed to pulse with an eerie glow in the dim light. I found myself inexplicably drawn to it, my curiosity piqued by the sense of history it emanated. I approached the mirror, admiring the craftsmanship of its frame, and caught my reflection. For a moment everything seemed normal, just my own face staring back at me. But then, out of the corner of my eye, I noticed movement. A figure, faint and translucent, appeared behind me in the mirror. I whipped around, heart pounding, but the shop was empty. Turning back to the mirror, I saw her clearly now, a young woman, her expression mournful, her eyes hollow and haunted. She wore an old-fashioned dress, its lace and silk faded but still elegant. She raised a hand as if to reach out to me, and I felt an icy chill crawl up my spine. 
Help me, she whispered, her voice barely audible but filled with desperation. Her eyes locked onto mine, and I felt an overwhelming sadness wash over me as if her sorrow were seeping through the glass. Who are you? I managed to ask, my voice trembling. Her lips moved, forming words I couldn't hear. Frustration etched across her face, and she pointed to something on the mirror's frame. I leaned in closer, noticing a small engraving I hadn't seen before. It read, Lucia, 1842. Lucia, I murmured, looking back at her reflection. Her eyes lit up with hope, and she nodded. Suddenly, the shop's owner appeared beside me, startling me. Ah, I see you found the mirror, he said, his tone oddly casual. Who is she? I asked, pointing to the apparition in the mirror. The owner glanced at the mirror, his expression unreadable. Lucia, he said softly. Her spirit has been trapped in that mirror for over a century. She was the daughter of a wealthy merchant who owned this very shop. Legend has it that she died tragically, and her soul became bound to the mirror. Is there any way to free her? I asked, feeling a strange connection to the sad figure in the glass. The owner sighed, his eyes distant. Some say there is a ritual that must be performed, but it's dangerous and no one has ever succeeded. Determination surged through me. Tell me what I need to do. He hesitated, then nodded and led me to a dusty old book filled with ancient incantations and rituals. As I prepared to undertake the perilous task of freeing Lucia, I glanced back at the mirror. Her eyes were full of hope, a glimmer of light in the darkness. With a deep breath, I began to read the incantation, feeling the air grow colder around me. The mirror vibrated, the glass rippling as if it were water. Lucia's figure became more defined, her presence almost tangible. As I completed the ritual, a blinding light filled the shop and I felt a rush of energy pass through me. When the light faded, the mirror was just a mirror again, and Lucia was gone. I stood there, breathless, hoping that she had finally found peace. 